Hello, my name is Mary, and I'm the Director of Youth Services at the Portland Public Library in Portland, Maine. And today, we're going to continue reading Ribsy by Beverly Cleary. It was published in 1964 by Harper Collins. Now, Ribsy's been on quite an adventure for about a month now after he got lost in the parking lot at the shopping center. Right now, he has been found by a boy named Joe Saylor, but his picture was in the paper. And Henry Huggins, sorry. Henry has just called Joe to find out about Ribsy. Joe had no way of knowing whether what Henry was saying was true or not. It sounded peculiar, that part about giving a dog a bubble bath. He certainly did not want to believe what he was hearing. Not when it was beginning to look as if he might get to keep the dog. Lots of dogs look like my dog, he said. I don't think he's your dog at all. Yes, he is, insisted Henry. I know he is. I could tell by the picture in the paper. Prove it, challenged Joe. He always shakes hands with his left paw, said Henry. Mr. Saylor did not like to listen to people talk on the telephone. What does the boy want, he asked, interrupting the conversation. Some kid thinks my dog is his, answered Joe. Says the dog shakes hands with his left paw. Mr. Saylor laughed. Tell him you haven't been introduced, he said, and returned to his paper. The dog and I haven't been introduced, said Joe to Henry. We never shook hands, but perhaps the dog does belong to the boy, protested Mrs. Saylor. Let Junior handle it, said Mr. Saylor. There was a silence from Henry's end of the line. Joe had a feeling Henry wanted to say something like, oh, a wise guy. Joe looked down the hall at Ribsy lying on the carpet and said, Okay, if he's your dog, why doesn't he have a license tag? He does have, said Henry, but when he got lost, he wasn't wearing his collar. I took it off so he could scratch his neck. Joe felt triumphant. He was still carrying a red rhinestone studded collar in his pocket. But this dog was wearing a collar when I found him. He realized too late that he had given away two bits of information. The dog had no license tag, and Joe had found him. He's been gone about a month, said Henry. Somebody else must have put a collar on him. You still haven't proved he's your dog said Joe, even though he had given out more information than he intended, he felt he had an advantage in the conversation. He could always hang up if he wanted to. My dad says he'll drive me over to your house, said Henry. You'll see. Ribsy will know me. Ribsy, said Joe. That's a dumb name for a dog. At the sound of his no name, Ribsy picked up his ears. He had not heard the word Ribsy for weeks. When I first got him, he was so thin his ribs showed, explained Henry. So I called him Ribsy. They don't show now, said Joe. Can't be the same dog. Well, so long. Wait! The boy on the other end of the line sounded desperate. My dad said he'd bring me over tonight. We're offering a reward for Ribsy. How much? 
Joe felt it could not be much. Ribsy was no fancy poodle or German shepherd. He was just a mutt. Ten dollars. Ten dollars. Ten whole dollars. Ten dollars was a lot of money to Joe, but he was not going to admit it to him, who he decided must have lots of money if he could offer a ten dollar reward for a dog when he could just get another just as good free at the Humane Society. Mutts like Ribsy didn't cost anything. Joe's silence must have worried Henry because he raised the reward. Ten dollars and my new flashlight. Can we come over now? Joe saw that he was gaining a new kind of advantage. After all, he could get another dog just as good as this one free of charge himself. If he stalled long enough, there was no telling what this boy might offer him. I don't know, he said, not committing himself. We're pretty busy. Anyway, I don't think he's your dog. He's happy here. I know he's my dog. Henry sounded worried. Then he seemed to have an idea. Hey, I know. Let me talk to him. This took Joe by surprise. On the phone? Sure, said Henry, sounding as if he talked to dogs on the telephone all the time. Joe was scornful of this suggestion. He did not believe a dog would pay any attention to a voice on a telephone, so he did not mind letting the boy try. Just a minute, he said. Ribsy heard Joe's fingers snapping for him to come. Obediently, he got up and trotted into the hall. Here, somebody wants to talk to you, said Joe, holding the telephone to Ribsy's ear. Hiya, Ribsy! Henry's voice came clearly through the telephone so that Joe could hear too. How's Ribsy? It worked. Ribsy began to bark. Ribsy! Henry was shouting. Ribsy! It is you! Well, what do you know, thought Joe. A dog would talk on the telephone. Ribsy barked harder. He could not understand where Henry could be, but he recognized the voice coming out of the black thing Joe was holding to his ear. Maybe if he barked hard enough, Henry would come out from wherever he was hiding. Ribs, Henry shouted again. Ribsy! Joe, who is now sure of a reward, felt that a conversation that consisted of barks and a dog's name yelled into a telephone was not getting any place. Ribsy's nose told him that Henry was not in the living room or even in the house, and so as Joe put the telephone back against his own ear, he ran to the front door. When it was not open instantly, he began to bark wildly and scratch at the wood. Henry had to be someplace on the other side. The startled sailors stared at him until Darlene darted across the room and opened the door. Still barking, Ribsy ran out into the night. Ribsy! The boy's voice came faintly from the telephone in the hall. Ribsy, what happened to you? Back on the sailor's porch, Ribsy heard Joe shouting to his sister. What did you let him go for? There's a reward for him. Ten whole dollars. Darlene answered, when a dog wants out, you're supposed to let him out. How was I to know he was worth so much? Then Joe's feet came pounding down the sidewalk behind Ribsy. Ribsy, he called, Ribsy, come back here. Ribsy wasn't going back. Henry was somewhere close by, and he was going to find him. Chapter 7, Ribsy and the Apartment House. Henry pressed the telephone against his ear as hard as he could. He heard a lot of barking, and then he heard Joe yell, What did you let him go for? There's a reward for him, ten old dollars. There was an answer in a girl's voice, which Henry could not catch. The sound of thumping feet, and then nothing but the sound of a television set tuned to a program with a lot of shooting, which his parents 
would not let him watch. I don't get it, said Henry to his mother and father, who'd been following his side of the conversation. There was a lot of barking, and now there isn't anyone on the line. Anybody home? He asked into the telephone a loud voice. There was no answer, only gunfire from the television set. Hang on a minute and see what happens, said Mr. Huggins. Now that we're this close to Ribsy, we can't let him get away. Henry strained to catch any sound that might come through the telephone. He heard barks that grew fainter, yelling, arguing, and finally a click as someone in the sailor household replaced the telephone receiver. That click was as final as a period at the end of a sentence. Slowly, he replaced the receiver. He thought a moment and then said, at least Ribsy recognized me. That's something. When Ribsy could run no more, he flopped down on the sidewalk in the dark to pant. As soon as he'd caught his breath, he got up again and started off at a brisk trot with his nose to the ground. The trouble was he did not know where he was going. It was all very puzzling. He had heard Henry Huggins' voice, but he could not find Henry. He stopped and barked, thinking that Henry would call. When there was no answer, he continued his search, hoping his nose would guide him. The sidewalk gave Ribsy the scent of many people and of a variety of dogs and of a cat or two, but it did not give him the scent of Henry. Ribsy became tired, confused, bewildered. Late that night, he gave up looking for Henry and went to sleep on the cold concrete in front of the coffee cup cafe with a lingering smell of hamburgers fried during the day gave him some comfort. Early the next morning, Ribsy woke up feeling stiff and hungry. The coffee cup cafe was not open. So he walked around to the back door where he found a garbage can that smelled interesting. It must have smelled interesting to some other dog too because the can had been tipped over and garbage was strewn around the ground. Ritzy helped himself to some bits of bun which were smeared with more relish than he cared for. He also ate the remains of a piece of pie. The best garbage had already been eaten, but at least his stomach was no longer completely empty. Ritzy wandered aimlessly around the neighborhood, which did not look at all like Clickitat Street with its green lawns and white houses surrounded by shrubbery. There was very little grass in this neighborhood and not many bushes, although there were a number of fire hydrants. Many of the buildings came right to the sidewalk and most of them were of brick and were three or four stories high. It was in front of one of these buildings that Ribsy first saw the boy with the tennis ball. He was a thin boy somewhat round-shouldered, who was sitting on the front steps, tossing the ball from one hand to the other. Naturally, Ribsy was interested in the boy with the tennis ball. While Ribsy was watching the boy, a young woman came out of the apartment house. She was wearing a black coat over the starched dress and apron of a waitress. Now see here, Larry Biggerstaff, she said. You keep out of trouble today. You hear? Yeah, Mom. Larry stopped tossing the ball. Ribsy decided he did not like the smell of this woman. It reminded him of Violet Bubble Bath. I don't want to hear any more complaints from the manager about you, continued his mother. Last Saturday, Mrs. Creech complained that you played a mouth organ in the hall, bounced a ball so that it disturbed the lady downstairs, and tried to climb down the fire escape. 
keep it up and you'll get us evicted. And then where will we go? Larry heaved a big sigh to show that he was disgusted with the whole situation. But mom, there's nothing to do. I don't even have a good ball to take to the playground. I don't have money to buy balls, said his mother. At noon, you come to the cafe and get your lunch. And in the meantime, keep out of trouble. She left the apartment house and hurried down the street, street toward the coffee cup cafe. Larry began to bounce the tennis ball, which was old and had lost much of its life. He had to throw it down hard to make it bounce at all. Nevertheless, the sight was a stimulating one to boot. He pranced right up to Larry and wagged his tail to show that he was ready to play. Larry did not understand. Go away, you old dog, he said crossly and muttered. I didn't even have a good ball. This boy needed educating, Ribsy barked to him, tell him that there was a dog ready to play with a tennis ball. Larry backed away. Ribsy wagged his tail and looked eager, but this only made Larry cautious. Plainly, Ribsy would have to show this boy how to play. He bowed before Larry, ran off a little way, and then came dashing back. Larry dropped the ball. Ribsy picked it up. You give me back my ball, said Larry. Ribsy dropped the ball and stood over it, wagging his tail. Cautiously, Larry advanced toward the ball. But when he was about to pick it up, Ribsy grabbed it in his jaws and went racing up the street. Hey, said Larry. Ribsy raced back, dropped the ball at Larry's feet and stood, waving his tail and looking hopefully up at the boy. Well, thanks, pal, said Larry, surprised and pleased. Woof, answered Ribsy. The boy finally understood. He threw the ball down the street and Ribsy bounded after it darting between the people who were walking along the sidewalk and catching it on the first bounce. He was delighted, and so was Larry. The boy threw the ball again and again for Ribsy to retrieve. Finally, Larry sat down the front steps of the apartment house, and Ribsy threw himself down at his feet to pant. You're a pretty nice dog, remarked Larry. I'd sure like to keep you, but old lady Creech would never let me. Ribsy laid his nose on his paws and looked up at Larry, who returned Ribsy's gaze. You hungry, Larry asked. Ribsy thumped his tail on the sidewalk. He liked having a boy talk to him. Larry liked having a dog to talk to. If you is a big cross dog, I bet old lady Creech would stop yelling at me. She'd be scared to yell if I had a big dog following me around. Ribsy rolled over on his back and allowed Larry to rub his stomach for him. You wait here, said Larry. No, that wouldn't work. You might run off while I was getting you something to eat. Can you be real quiet? Again, Ribsy thumped his tail. Come on, then. I'll get you some cornflakes or a weenie or something, said Larry, and pulled the key out of his pocket. Ribsy followed him up the stairs, and Larry unlocked the front door. Inside, he tiptoed past the door of the apartment occupied by the manager of the building to an old-fashioned elevator. Ribsy was ready to enjoy this new game the boy was playing. Larry opened a glass door and folded back a metal gate. Ribsy followed him into what appeared to be a small square room without windows. Larry closed the gate and the door and pushed a button on the wall. There was a whirring sound and suddenly Ribsy had a feeling he had never felt before. He felt as if he was going up while his stomach stayed down. He did not like the feeling one bit. He did not like this strange little room. He wanted out right now. He began to bark. Shh, 
Harry seemed upset about something because he scowled and grabbed at Ribsy. Shh, she'll hear you. The manager had already heard. A door on the first floor flew open, and a woman's cross voice called up, Larry Biggerstaff, you get that dog out of this building at once. It was the kind of voice that could make a dog slink away feeling guilty. By that time, the little room had stopped at the second floor. Larry slid back the gate and opened the glass door. Before he stepped out, he whispered, you stay right here. I'll come back and get you in a minute. Then he left the frightened dog and shut him in the little room. Ribsy did not know what to do. He did not want to stay in the little room alone, but there was no way he could get out. He was even afraid to bark, so he made little anxious noises. Suddenly he felt himself beginning to rise again while his stomach seemed to stay behind. He barked for Larry to come and get him out of this place, but all he heard was the whir of machinery and the thump of Larry's sneakers running downstairs. As the elevator stopped on the third floor and his stomach caught up, Ribsy heard Larry's frightened voice coming up the elevator shaft from the first floor. Dog! What dog? He was saying, I don't have a dog. Don't you lie to me, the manager said. I know there's a dog in this building. It isn't my dog, said Larry. Upstairs, a woman opened the door and pushed back the gate. Hello, the woman, said the woman to Ribsy as if she met dogs in elevators every day. How did you manage to press the button? This time, Ribsy was taking no chance of being left in the frightening room that made him lose his stomach. He dashed past the woman and into the third floor hall while the door of the elevator closed behind him. Now he did not know what to do. He was in a long hall with a strip of worn carpet down the center, doors on either side. At one side of the hall was a staircase, and at the end of the hall was a window with a fire escape sign over it. Nothing looked familiar to Ribsy, who had never been in an apartment house before. Larry's voice came up the stairwell, but I don't have a dog. Ribsy did not only did the only thing he could think of. He started down the stairs toward Larry's voice. Young man, said Mrs. Creech, you took a dog into that elevator. You can't fool me. Ribsy hesitated. He did not like this woman's voice. It reminded him of too many voices that had yelled, you get off my lawn, to him. Sometimes voices like this were accompanied by a rock or clod of dirt. Ribsy heard the elevator door open, down on the first floor, and the manager say in quite a different voice, Oh, good morning, Mrs. Berg. I was looking for a dog in the elevator. There's no dog in the elevator, said Mrs. Berg, who was a friend of Larry's and who understood the situation. I have come to pay my rent. Certainly, said the manager. Just step into my apartment while I write your receipt. Ribsy stood listening at the steps, but all he heard was the elevator door close and the machinery whir. As the elevator rose, Ribsy started cautiously down the steps. He did not know what to expect in this strange building where rooms went up in the air. The second floor looked exactly like the third, which Ribsy had just left. The same strip of carpet, the same doors on either side, the same window with a sign over it at the end of the hall. Ribsy felt confused. He was even more confused when he heard a whispered psst. It was Larry, who was supposed to be down below, but who is now up above. Well, Ribsy had walked down to the second floor, Larry had ridden up to the third. Woof, answered Ribsy, who wanted to get out of this place. <laughs> Larry's worried face appeared in the stairwell above Ribsy. He came tiptoeing down the steps. I gotta get you out of here, he whispered. Come on. He started to lead Ribsy on down the steps when the door of the manager's apartment opened on the first floor. Thank you, Mrs. Berg, the manager was saying. We can't go down that way. We 
whispered Larry. Come on, this way. Ribsy obeyed because he did not know where to go by himself and because he wanted to stay away from the woman with the angry voice. Larry led him down the hall toward the back stairs, which were near the window with the sign over it. He was about to start down with Ribsy when he heard someone coming up. And we will end our story here today at this point. And then next time we'll find out what happens. Will Ribsy get out of that apartment house in one piece? We're reading Ribsy by Beverly Cleary. It was published in 1964 by HarperCollins. And thank you so much for coming to read with us today. My name's Mary, and I'm coming to you from the Portland Public Library in Portland, Maine. And until next time, bye-bye.